Is the most effective border that little rubber thing on the grocery store conveyor belt? I don't know. Let's talk about it. This is the real story with Adam and Sherry. I'm Adam Hamalian. And I'm Sherry Hutchins. And this is where we talk about all things real estate. It's primarily for our clients, some for our colleagues, and mostly because we like hanging out with each other. So today we're going to talk about um, boundaries, property lines, and maybe property line disputes that come up and what are some ways that we figure out what a boundary actually looks like. Uh, so Sherry, when we first go out to look at properties, the general assumption is that the fences represent the property lines, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, can you tell, talk a little bit about how we know what property lines are and how to figure out where they go? That is correct. It's one of the most common questions we get when we're taking people out to look at houses. And I don't know how they learn to ask this question, but they gesture to a fence and they say, is that the property line? And we say, I don't know. We don't know. And why don't we know? Because that fence can be put anywhere, um, literally anywhere. And sometimes it's accurate and sometimes it's not. The only accurate way to find out where a property line is to have a property survey done um, by a professional surveyor. So most of the time, fences are in the general neighborhood of the property line. And if they're not right on it, they're within a few inches of it. But sometimes they're not. And that can be really confusing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's important to, to figure out where that property line is. I think in two particular occasions, one is if you're going to build a new fence. Mm -hmm. And two is if you're when you're going to do an addition that might get really close to a setback. So zoning laws require certain setbacks in certain communities, like a side, a common side setback is 10 feet um, and a common backyard uh, property line actually might be even less and a front setback is usually about 20 feet, but it varies by community. So those aren't um, necessarily um, locked into place. Um, so if you just built a fence, um, a new fence on each side of your property and in back, how did you decide where to build it? So that's a good question. Um, so my backyard fence, there is a county um, chain link fence, which I think is pretty close to the property line. Um, but on that back fence, we basically just wanted to hide that chain link fence. So we built a new fence just inside that. We might have given up about six inches of our property, but it wasn't like we gave it to anybody except for the squirrels. And yeah, I know the, the squirrels are demanding. The um, But the side fence is, um, basically, I had a handshake agreement with both my neighbors to just build it exactly where the old fence was, uh, and we all agreed to it, and and we could have been wrong. We could be off by a foot on both sides. No. Um, hopefully not, but, you know, the, that's that's where it is. You know, I had to build that, that fence on the one side because what I had to build, what prompted the whole fence building was um, there was a hole in the fence, and my dog, my late dog who's since passed away, Gretel, um, what's going through a hole in the fence and it I, we didn't realize that at first um, we, we would let the dog out for some backyard time and she was spending a lot of time like laying in the sun and exploring through the garden and you know I'm not paying attention just kind of wait till she came back to the door to bark to come in and uh, I think we kind of sensed that she was taking longer on these times outside and we we're just thankful that she was enjoying all the different crevices of our yard only to discover that she was going through this hole in the fence. And I was embarrassed that, the, you know, my dog was going into the neighbor's yard and hopefully wasn't making a mess over there, only to discover that my neighbor, it's a young couple that lives there, and the wife was working from home, was has taken affection to our dog Gretel and was letting her into her house for like a half hour at a time, got a got a dog bed and put it next to her desk. And Gretel was just having this great time with this new person that was giving her love and affection. Uh -huh. and, and then at one point, we they sent us a Christmas photo of our dog with their Christmas tree. <laughs> that is funny. It is funny. I mean, you know, it was a little bit concerning, but I know that they loved Gretel and they weren't upset by the trespassing. But all the same, I felt like it's time to build, rebuild the fence because the repairs weren't holding. It was just like things were falling down. And then at some point, the wind just blew it all the way over. Um, and That's the neighbor funny. actually asked, 
say, hey, can we build like a little Gretel sized <laughs> door in the fence so that she could still come to visit? And I'm like, no, I want my dog back. No, <laughs> go get your own dog. <laughs> I know they had a baby instead. I don't think she's missing the dog at the moment. Oh, so funny. her baby's about a year old at this point. I think she just had her one year baby, a one year birthday. So I this is about property lines and boundaries, but do you remember for just one more dog story uh, during the pandemic when I was finally home during the day? And it's funny, about a week or two before uh, we went into lockdown, I was noticing that something in my backyard was leaving little deposits on the um, lawn. And I thought, what now? Because it's kind of like the wild kingdom back there. You never know what- All sorts of animals in your backyard. Exactly. And anyway, I just didn't think much about it until the first day we were in lockdown. And all of a sudden I look out my back window, my sliding glass door, and there's a little white dog walking around my backyard. And um, I, you know, opened the door and it was, and it was just offended that I was um, one, here and two asking what it was doing in my yard and it just barked and barked and barked and barked like go back to where you came from go back to the office it turns out it was my neighbor's dog chuckles chuckles and, yeah chuckles <laughs> what a name chuckles was not actually that funny um but he had discovered where there was a loose fence in the or loose board in the fence and he would just push it and then walk through and then come hang out in my yard so then outrage that you were you were in his but her his yeah, that's her, right yeah his backyard i think chuckles was a boy i think yeah. so yeah but i okay. did not put him on my christmas card that year so well that yeah too bad poor chuckles yeah uh, kind of did your bad. did your fence get fixed does chuckles still come visit no chuckles does not come um visit just, I think just the squirrels picture. and raccoons now huh uh-huh and the possums and the skunk oh yeah, yeah. You got a whole animal kingdom going on over there. Uh -huh. Oh, and we haven't talked about the turkeys. All right. Well, your own private zoo. All right. Sounds good. Maybe you need some border protection also. <laughs> exactly. Sounds, sounds like you got the wild frontier out there. Uh, no kidding. Um, speaking of the wild frontier, I think one of the things that's interesting um, that here in California, we have a lot of fences, but that's not true everywhere. Um, yeah. uh, that that there are some states where they just have uh, not even like rural properties, even in urban settings. Weren't you telling me about a friend in Maryland? Yeah, my friend Camille lives in um, Towson, Timonium area, which is north of Baltimore. And um, I was so surprised the first time I visited her years ago, go out on the back deck and um, there's no fences in any of the backyards. The houses are lined up. And it's just one big backyard and back behind the houses, no fences, none. Yeah, different communities. It's interesting. Yeah, I guess you have to really like your neighbor, but then they don't have any property line disputes either. So, well, or they do. Who knows? Speaking <laughs> of property line disputes, bringing it back to real estate, um, yeah. I was wondering if you could tell a little bit about that uh, that uh, one um, family that we sold a house for that was a, a lot split and how the fence didn't match up with the property lines. Oh, yeah, an inter family lot split. So, I think was this during the pandemic? Here we go on the mm -hmm. pandemic again. We got a call um, from a woman who said she wanted to sell her father's house. He had passed away and he had a house over on White Park in your neighborhood. And it was a little tiny, cute white house at the very front of a lot. And um, I don't know if you know this, back in the day, they had long, narrow lots because they didn't have plumbing uh, and they would put the septic tank all the way at the back of this um, lot um, away from the house and with room for the leech lines, which is a whole nother podcast, unfortunately, mm -hmm. maybe not that interesting. But um, when, you know, city plumbing came into being, they didn't need those big lots anymore. They did, took out the septic tanks. And in this case, he did a lot split and sold or gave his daughter the back half of the property. And she built a beautiful home back there. Um, they created a driveway on the right side of the property. So um, there was an easement so she could drive back to her home. Um, and at the first appointment that we went out to meet with her, she said, yeah, I live back there. My dad lived here. Oh, and by the way, my property, my fence is four feet on my dad's property. She, That's right. she wanted a bigger yard and dad didn't need it. So he let no. her. 
He let her do it. Yeah, it was just an informal agreement within the family. And could it could have been a disclosure, I suppose, but we elected to give her the advice to go and talk to Rick Human, a uh, property surveyor over in Lafayette, have the property, re have it surveyed, have that lot line moved. And I mean, he did an amazing job for us. He even prepared the deeds, which of course they would do, which got signed, notarized and recorded with the county. And then, and then the fence was on the right property line and we proceeded with the sale. I think part. there was something with the driveway too, and I can't remember. I think it was an easement, and the easement was, I think, like 10 feet, but they were actually using 17. So I think they expanded the easement as yeah. well, but not changed the, the lot line. Yeah, I think that I think that is correct, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, that was yeah, it was good that we straightened that out before we put that house on the market so that the buyers knew exactly what they were buying. And when they got a preliminary title report where it describes the, the lot that's being sold, it, it accurately matched closer to where the fence were, so what your perception is, but that there wasn't any dispute about who was using that extra bit of land. Yeah, it's all fine and good when you're related, father and daughter, and you have yeah. this ending, but when it's two people who don't know each other, um it's a whole different story in fact i wrote an offer on a house um in rancho san miguel once where there was a disclosure that said that the behind the house neighbor was suing the seller of the house i wrote on because her fence was four inches four inches yeah four inches on his property we didn't end up buying that house for other reasons than that but you can see how things get a little um interesting when fences aren't on the right uh, you know property line so we had that uh situation on a listing um up in on poplar here in walnut creek oh, where yeah. where there was a shed a long time existing shed that was built right on the property line on the back property line and um it was interesting because uh so the owner of the longtime owner of the home had passed away and a successor trustee was the one who was selling the property and so really didn't have much knowledge of it but we we were at a doing the first weekend open house and the backyard neighbor came over and announced to everyone at this open house your shed is on my property and i want you to take it down Gotta love the neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. This is where we tell people if you don't disclose it, your neighbors will. And no, sometimes they do it in an open house. I mean, it didn't scare people off. We ended up getting multiple offers, but well, sometimes they do it and it's not accurate either. Sometimes yeah. it's very accurate. But in this case, I don't think it was. No, it wasn't, but it it did make us do go do our little little bit of research and and uh cross our T's and dot our I's. And this, the longtime owner had done a, a lot survey because he was exploring adding on to his house at one point, but never did it. And in this survey, and I think you found it, a bunch of documents that were all rolled up in some place in this person's uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, filing system, which he had files for everything. Yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He was, it was as, as a seller, especially as one who had passed away, he was an amazing seller. Um yeah but it showed that the shed was right on the property line and um we contacted a lawyer and talked with some other people and did some research and it was interesting the the i can't remember it was the lawyer or the surveyor said you know the pencil line on those drawings could be four inches because it's that small of a scale um, and not that exact but that pretty much it was right on the the back property line and um so we we shared this information with the neighbor and said can you share with us your evidence that you think it's over and it turned out that he, his evidence was he looked at google maps and if you go to google maps and even in satellite view uh, google will overlay what they think are property lines and actually outlines of buildings and sure enough when you looked at that it looked like the the structure might have been as much as three feet over the property line and so it wasn't as narrow as potentially four inches or nothing depending on how wide that pencil line was and um he i don't want to say he quietly went away but we didn't hear anything else from him and we properly disclosed all of that information to future buyers and we still i don't remember how many offers we had i think it was like seven or eight no, no, no. We had 16 offers on that property. Yeah, 16 offers. And the eventual person who bought it, that wasn't, a, they didn't worry about them. And, and, um, 
lots uh, in the shed did not have to get torn down yeah. because it wasn't over the property line. Although it's interesting that if that shed was built today, it would not have been allowed to be close to either fence because it backed up to the neighbor's fence on both sides, neighbor on the left and neighbor behind the property. Yeah. I, I hate to use the term grandfathered in because we're not supposed to use that term anymore, but it was grandfathered in. So it was allowed to be um, on those backing up to those fences, but it wouldn't have been that way. You know, just in the last couple of weeks, I was learning about the origin of that term grandfathered in. And I think I'm going to work on um, not using it anymore. I, the origin of it had to do with um, laws in the South, voting laws in the South post reconstruction. And that the South was passing laws that said that if your grandfather was free, then you had the right to vote. Um, right. Which, of course, is her horrendous to even think about that. So it, it, the the technical term that we're going to have to start learning to use is legal non-conforming. Yeah. It legally exists. You don't have to tear it down, um, but it's not conforming to the current zoning or current laws. Yeah. And so legal non-conforming, little trivia there. Uh, well, I don't know if it's just trivia, uh, a little healthy, little healthy growth for us old dogs. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so interesting. I, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but I loved that shed. It was a it was a two part shed with it was a big shed with a dividing yeah. line in the middle. I think he had paint storage because he was a painter uh, on half of it. And the other part was maybe a workshop or something like that. But all I could think about when I saw it was taking that metal divider down and, and having a big, wonderful quilt room out there. Well, you know, the other thing, it didn't even look like a shed because it had um, siding that almost looked like it was going to be from like an Eichler style with that really thin vertical lines uh, very evenly, not the, you know, cheap T11 four inch on center. And it had real windows in it that yeah. let it natural light and all sorts of stuff. In fact, a couple people, uh, I was common to ask if it was an ADU it looked so nice from the outside and with yeah. a little bit of fix up it could have really been a great space I don't know maybe the future person that bought it from us made something else out there but maybe uh, we'll have to do yeah. a, a podcast on ADUs because of course everybody looks at that and thinks oh somebody can live in there it's like well maybe maybe they can yeah, yeah maybe they can't but we'll talk about that in another time that seller was really uh, um, meticulous. And while he was a house painter, um, I don't think that we really appreciate his artistry. Um, he he had like all the pigments in that storage shed to just make slight changes to colors of paint. Uh, so he was the kind of uh, painter who would um, paint a room, but like say the sun would shine on a certain wall at times of the day and change the, how the room looked. So he would add a slight tint to the paint on that one wall so that all the walls stayed looking the same color at, at a prime time during the day with that natural sunlight. And I think that um, it, I, we didn't know that when we walked into it the first time, but the, it, it looked like it was just a beautiful house, even though the house was very small and simple. And I, I think we got that contract because one of the first things out of our mouths when we first walked in, was like, this paint job is amazing. Um, we loved that pale, pale, buttery yellow that yeah. he had painted that front room in. And it's not how we normally sell houses, but it was absolutely gorgeous. And we commented on that. And apparently the other agent that we were competing against um, walked in the door and said, oh, this yellow is going to have to go. And um, I'm not sure if that's why we got the listing, um, but it they definitely made a note that we loved that paint. We didn't just say it; we loved that. We loved yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you know, rule, rule number one is always compliment a client's house. Like yeah. they they obviously <laughs> love the way it is, and so we are very careful when we suggest changes, especially to paint colors. Um, but rule number one is that that client loves their house. You should love it too. And that'll be the easiest way to sell this if you see its value. Luckily, both you and I love houses, which is one of the reasons that we do this, you know, yeah. and beauty in any house, well, almost any house. Yeah. <laughs> and we were, um, we teased the the boundary conversation about our, um, the grocery store rubber strips, the most effective property um, dividers out there. Um, it, you know, like if, if your groceries something rolled over that into somebody else's like sheer panic about whether you should grab it and move it back like i'm just taking my it's my orange i'm sorry you feel like you're intruding somebody else's space but you know the other boundary thing that i 
that I uh, I think is highly effective is I don't know whether you had this, but the imaginary line that your sibling draw drew across the back seat on long road trips. Do not cross this line. And <laughs> and uh, uh, did you have anything like that in your family? No, there were four of us. There were very few boundaries in the back seats because you know there there were four of us. <laughs> yeah, even on those long road trips to Wyoming and North Carolina. Yeah, North Carolina, North Dakota, North Dakota, North yeah. Dakota yeah. Wyoming and North Dakota. I don't remember because the only way I could avoid being car sick was to sleep through the whole day. Um, otherwise, it, things got ugly. But um, so I don't know what my siblings were doing about boundaries, but um, there were a lot of kids and not that much room. It wasn't like you and your brother, just the two of you in the back seat on either side of the car. Yeah, you probably were always touching each other. What what kind of vehicle did you guys drive? Like, was it a, a station wagon or what was, what did you guys well, have? Well, my dad worked for Volkswagen and um, we had a Volkswagen bus, a blue and white one. So nice. How did yeah. that go over in Wyoming and in North Dakota? <laughs> I think everybody thought we were hippies or at least, at least my dad, you know, he had longish hair, not too long, big, long sideburns and, um, he wore shorts, which I don't think anybody in North Dakota even today wears shorts. But we went into a restaurant and uh, oh, and Birkenstocks. Oh, but, Birkenstocks. And, well, cool. and socks, but quite a know. sense of California look from the early seventies. That's yeah. Just, yeah. We got a lot of looks when we were going into restaurants at night for dinner with my dad, looking like he was a hippie. Yeah, so he didn't really look like a hippie, but um, I don't know if I've told you the story, and this may cross some sort of a boundary. Who knows? But. Um, you know, my dad had three little girls who had to go to the bathroom all the time. And it just drove him crazy that we had to stop and go, you know, to let us go potty. And so one summer he came up with this idea that he was going to take a Folgers coffee can, put it in the back of the Volkswagen bus. And if we had to go to the bathroom, we had to like teeter over the top of that can. No. Oh. Yes. Yes. True. True story. Oh I mean, this was a man who had a schedule, you know, he had a certain number of miles that he needed to make every day and he could be stopping at every re rest, stop, rest stop when one of the girls, you know, needed to go to the bathroom. So oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, maybe it was just trying to, every time he had to get that Volkswagen bus going again, like, you know, it was like, once it got going, it wasn't going to stop. My exactly. parents actually had a Volkswagen bus also. They, um, their honeymoon was uh, to go to Baja, California in it. So I think maybe our parents were pseudo hippies i don't think either one of them were actually hippies but no. but to somebody in the midwest they probably seemed like a hippie because you know who wears short what man wears shorts and birkenstocks i know exactly and drives that german vehicle exactly <laughs> the um well yeah, as you mentioned uh it's just my brother and i and my brother's four years older than me and i remember the the last um, vacation that we took as a family it wasn't in a Volkswagen bus, but it was a van up through Oregon and Washington and Vancouver. And there were definitely some boundary issues in the back seat between my brother and I. And um, uh, now my brother is like six seven. He's not big, but he's tall, and and uh, he takes up more than his fair share. And so I, I, there was that that boundary line wasn't respected from his side just because he couldn't fit it and from my side because you know I was like 13 and a younger brother so of course I was annoying always reaching over and doing something um, and um, I know right and so we it was 21 day camping trip we stayed at 19 different campgrounds only stayed in hotels twice oh my and, gosh your um, mom you could, was a saint it, oh yeah you have no idea I'll tell more stories about this later but we um uh, so you just, just imagine the family dynamics on this trip and like on day 17 my brother starts teasing me well he didn't start but he was teasing me and it was about day 17 and he says you know what your middle initial stands for and I said well of course A it stands for Albert that was my grandfather's first name and that's how I got the name and I was like pretty proud of myself because I got grandpa's name and you didn't so you know I was uh, you know, leaning into the to the little brother thing and uh, my brother retorts no uh, it actually stands for annoying the doctor just wouldn't let them put that on mom and dad put that on the birth certificate <laughs> so, so i'm fully aware i'm being teased here but i go along with it and i go mom is that true and on day 17 of a 21 day camping trip my mom says yes it's true yes, yes so, it's true <laughs> so you know 12 year old 13 year old little brother is annoying whether it's by name or not so the boundary did not work in the back seat it, it wasn't wasn't as uh, friendly as a, a good neighborly fence. Exactly. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's uh, about it for our boundary conversation. If you have questions about your property line uh, and boundaries, we'd be happy to help you with that. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of having a surveyor come out and identify where your the lines are in relationship to your house and your fence so that when you build a new one, they're built in the right place. Um, and sometimes it's just for your own peace of mind of having a sense of where where the corners are. So yeah. uh, any other thoughts you had, Sherry? No, I think that's it. We've had more than our share, uh, fair share of property line uh, issues. Yes, so. that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, if you liked, if uh, you enjoyed our conver uh, our podcast, be sure to press subscribe and like and share us with your friends and neighbors. We gather here every week to talk about all things real estate. This is the real story with Adam and Sherry. Hope you're having a good time and have a good week. Thanks. Now. Bye bye. Bye.